everyone! Welcome to another WWE pay-per-view review from the CC Network. I'm Fred, your ever-reliable host as always, and today we'll be looking back at Great Balls of Fire, Raw's latest pay-per-view extravaganza that emanated from the American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas just last night. Now, while this event may have had the worst pay-per-view name in all of recorded history, the build has been somewhat solid. Now, while Raw is still not watchable in its entirety every week, trust me, I don't, it's been ensuring that this event, with a silly name, has actually been hyped and anticipated by fans because of its decent quality. Now, with a blockbuster main event, stipulation matches galore, and two former teammates going at it, it should be, if nothing else, a decent show, right? The thing is, though, will it better the poor SmackDown offering that Money in the Bank was last month. We'll have to wait and see, and I'm hoping it will, because uh, Money in the Bank didn't set my soul on fire. Hopefully this one will set my balls on fire. Yeah, that doesn't sound very good when reading it off, does it? Nonetheless, the event kicked off with Neville defeating Akira Tozawa to retain the Cruiserweight Championship on the pre-show, and of course the eponymous Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis was the theme song. I will actually say this, I love the fact we have brand new custom-made graphics for this, because... I've noticed WWE pay-per-views often have used the same pay-per-view graphics on screen since about 2014 for some of them. It's quite irritating, so seeing brand new, crisp, well-rendered graphics as a production person like me makes it very exciting. Anyway, away from all that, let's crack on with this thing, and we kick off, surprisingly, not just in card placement but result as well, with Bray Wyatt defeating Seth Rollins off a rate to the eyes and Sister Abigail in 12 minutes and 10 seconds. And when I say surprising, I damn sure mean it, because I wasn't expecting the best match on the card, in my opinion, to come from let alone the opening contest, but one of the most uninteresting feuds that Raw has had in recent times, if of course you cancel Ambrose and Miz out, we'll get to that later. Now this was exactly what I wanted from these two, as their build-up was as flat and as cryptic as you could get when you know you have Wyatt and an underwhelming babyface Rollins at the helm of it. But they delivered a physical and interesting match with the Eater of Worlds, ring awareness and demanding physicality, coupled with his and Rollins' speed to allow an even contest to mature out of nothing and give a sense of unpredictability to a bout that surprised the Dallas crowd enough to where they got really behind it. It was back and forth, free-flowing, lasted a short amount of time than many believed it would, and it delivered enough body psychology and chemistry to be enjoyable enough to give me a massive smile as this event started. And while some may believe that these two wrestlers are capable of much, much more, they are very athletic after all, I'll say this, I liked the simplistic way they dealt with the psychology and their movements, allowing a quick pace to make up the difference for that, and helping to substantiate and craft the rest of his matches qualities, not making them feel jarring or forced or gimmicky. The story of Wyatt trying to impose himself as a powerful entity over Rollins through dominance and intensity worked wonders, and through an underhanded yet decisive victory, which you noted throughout the course of the match, it re-establishes himself on the Raw roster, and when coupling with Rollins' raw charisma and athleticism, they manage to resurrect a horrible feud and deliver on a stage where everything matters, because for me, on pay-per-view, I actually give a damn. When it's on Raw or SmackDown, I really couldn't care less whether it actually turned out for the better or not, because I'm not rating this stuff. This match delivered in a way I wasn't expecting, and I am really, really happy with that. It may be a little rough around the edges at times, but at its core, this was the kind of quality match I knew these two could pull off, and I'm happy to award it a three-star rating. And I didn't see this coming, and it was a wonderful surprise. And the thing is, if this is only the starting block for these two, could you imagine if the feud actually picks up and delivers something even better come SummerSlam? Oh, that's making me very happy indeed. Raw... And your writing team, it's up to you to make me have this excitement be kept all the way through to your August extravaganza. Because seriously, this is a three-star match based off a nothing feud. If you can build on that, you're going to make me one very happy person indeed. Next up, we had the titanic battle of two of New York City and the surrounding area's favourite sons. As Big Cass defeated Enzo Amore off a big boot in 5 minutes and 25 seconds. Just about as long as it took for Enzo to unload his Frank Sinatra influence promo. Which I'm happy to say if you ended up muting your TVs or your computers or whatever the hell, it did improve as it went on. Because it started off cringy 
and slightly uncoordinated, but damn, Enzo knew how to rally that back and make it really impassioned. I really was rooting for him until I remembered I was predicting Cass and, well... You can't win them all, Enzo, can you? Now, this match was nothing more than a squash match, an elongated one as such, but I don't think I've ever seen a more enjoyable one since Cena and Brock came together three years ago and butted heads at SummerSlam. Now, seeing Enzo valiantly try to keep himself in this while the cocksure Cass enjoyed the decimation of his former partner and lapping up all the booze, it took its less is more mentality and cast the check right into the bank, allowing for a fast check control pace and a somewhat decent crowd reaction, giving a seemingly throwaway squash match a lot of life and meaning, making it look a lot better than it had any right to be. Now while the rating factor score says otherwise, it was a surprisingly enjoyable little match that used its time wisely. However, if Enzo had kicked out of a near fall or two, or Cass had raised the shoulder off the mat following the big boot to increase the punishment and make Enzo's suffering be even more longer than it was, this would have really cracked two stars easily. And that's not even a question, it would have. Unfortunately though, as a result of lacking those extra bits, I'm gonna give it one and a half stars for its efforts. Now maybe they shouldn't have had that impassioned promo beforehand. Now, I enjoyed it even though it started out rough, but giving this match a little longer would have really helped iron out some kinks. And speaking of one major kink, I'm not a huge fan of Cass's new theme song. It's just really generic and horrible. I also don't like that Cephos have a lot of silent games gaps in their songs. When you listen to Rollins' theme and the Authors of Pain theme, for example, it just ruins the flow of it when you just have a random gap of silence. It really annoys me, and it makes it just feel so disjointed and horrible, and Cass's is roughly the same. I thought I heard some silence in there. First time hearing it on quite poor quality television audio, I'm bound to make some mistakes, but... As long as they actually make it heavier and more intense, they may have a decent theme song on their hands, but... I'm not impressed. Hopefully on Raw tonight, I might actually be able to be turned by it, but who knows? Big Cass, you dominated this match, but you may want to go and kick Cephos in the head to give you something less generic, because yeah, you're deserving of much better in the music department. Next up, we have the 30-minute Tag Team Iron Man match for the Raw Tag Team Championships. Apparently the first one ever. They couldn't stop talking about it. Now we had Sheamus and Cesaro defeating the Hardy Boys by four falls to three to retain said titles. Now while many would call this the match of the night, it just barely got beaten in my opinion by the opener because if you look at both of the rating factors, they're pretty much the exact same, but just in different areas. Now. What actually put the opener over it? The fact that that match had much more crowd reaction for its broader scope, and it was also faster and more intense. Now, when the sudden falls of Cesaro and Sheamus came along, they took an early lead. It was nice in building tension and their superiority, but the slow, meandering pace really left a lot to be desired for me, despite actually having a nice, solid crowd reaction and storytelling as the Hardys got back into it, with a lot of daring physicality on display to help. Now, the final 10 minutes, that was great, and it helped propel this match's score up by throwing pace, storytelling, drama, and tension at you as it reached peak mass. It was a match that took its time to build, but these two teams worked hard, bludgeoning each other to the point where blood and potential concussions came through to show that these two teams really wanted this. And it paid off immeasurably. The Hardys looked strong in unfair yet understandable defeat by a younger and stronger and hungrier team. I just wish it was a little more substance in the first, what, 10, 20 minutes? Because there wasn't much going on and it really annoyed me. Because the crowd also sat on their hands knowing they had to be loud for later because that's where all the best stuff happens. I like it in an Iron Man match if people actually gave a crap for most of it. That would be nice because then it allows me to keep my excitement. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case and I would have also liked to have had my enjoyment rating be boosted by having more risks taken, and I've already highlighted the enthusiasm for the crowd as well, and overall, I just feel there was enough here for a great match, but it was only a good one. A pretty good one at three stars as well. Now, these guys have delivered consistent pay-per-view matches over the course of the last few months since WrestleMania, and with the feud seemingly at an end, they did a fine job of showcasing their talents to a wider audience, and I cannot be unhappy with that. 
Let's just hope that both of these teams' new opponents can deliver the same type of match quality, because if not, Raw's pay-per-views in the future are going to suffer a nosedive where it has been peaking in recent months. And I'm hoping that doesn't happen, because Sheamus and Cesaro... Hopefully they've got someone good, because seriously, those two, probably my favourite things on Raw right now outside of Strowman. And that's saying a lot of things, really, when you think about it. Following that, we had the Raw Women's Championship match with Sasha Banks defeating Alexa Bliss by countout in 11 minutes and 40 seconds after a slap to the face and a lack of fucks given. Bliss retained the title, obviously, but she didn't have a lot of time to bask in that, with Sasha hitting her double knees off the Raw announced table off the stage. Pretty nice indeed. Now this match, much like most of Alexa Bliss's matches, followed a very similar formula, showcasing her as a ruthless bitch who utilizes her character's psychology to drive a match which lacks a lot in substance due to its simple and grounded nature. Now it was held by Sasha repeatedly not actually doing her job by refusing to sell the back that Alexa had worked on for most of the contest, meaning it didn't have the je ne sais quoi that I would have liked to have had from the story front. Because as you know, if you've listened to my reviews or followed me for a number of years, if there is enough of good psychology in there, I will start enjoying a match more. Ah, Sasha, if you're running around after having your back targeted, hold the damn thing. Slow the hell down. Even when you had the post-match beatdown, you had to run full pelt. You had a bad back. What the hell? It's, ah, that's just one thing that really annoyed me. God, that's... Ah. Probably the one thing that really stopped this match from getting any further. The countout finish I felt was fine, fitting of Alexa's cunning character, highlighted by that beautiful dislocation double joint trick, which I've seen before, but damn it never gets old. And given that the energy and the pace of the match was fast enough throughout to ensure it had substance of some degree, it meant that the length wasn't too long, but way longer than many would have thought, including myself. Now, all in all, it didn't bore me. But it wasn't helped by the crowd for the most part, just sitting on their hands until they gave it credit for its physicality and got behind it eventually. But by the time the finish came, it was just too late and the match was impacted. It was somewhat enjoyable, but Sasha and Alexa both stopped this match from getting any higher. Now, I've already highlighted that I appreciate the boss is a good seller, but like I said, we're not selling an injury throughout the contest, even post-match. It's just unacceptable. As for Alexa... Her matches are surprisingly stale, <laughs> but she needs to utilize her in-ring skills more because her character working and psychology skills with it are stunning. I love that about her. It's why she's the best woman on the roster, period. The thing is, though, she needs to utilize her in-ring skills and show that she can keep up with more athletic counterparts, especially on Raw. She needs to hold up and put her game up to match. Otherwise, these matches with her as champion will not start improving as quality goes through. Because I am rating her matches on average roughly around a one and a half star each, roughly each time. And it's annoying me that I have to keep doing that. And these kinds of issues neutered what was turning into a solid match. And as a result, it came out of it feeling a little dejected at one and a quarter stars. Now, I know these two will probably knock it out of the park when SummerSlam comes around, considering the finish. They might get a Falls Count Anywhere stipulation, which will really cover both of these women's weaknesses and have their strengths heightened for sure. I am hoping. But seriously, this match could have been great. And while it was a good showing for Sasha after spending a couple of months in the wilderness, I was expecting a lot better from these two. And that message of statement is true. I want Sasha to improve in her selling ability throughout a match. And I want Alexa to improve on her in-ring skills. If we can do that, these two could potentially put a two, three star match on my plate. And I would eat that up in a heartbeat. And ladies and gentlemen, we are not done yet as the title matches keep on coming, this time with the IC title up for grabs, with The Miz defending his title quite controversially against Dean Ambrose, winning off some Bo Dowers interference and a skull-crushing finale to retain in 11 minutes and 20 seconds. Now, this match, much like the feud, was just kind of there. It was solemnly predictable for you waiting for the inevitable outside assistance, screwy finish that you predicted was coming, you knew it was going to happen, because why the blue hell would they be out there? That even the great selling of Ambrose and the leg psychology from The Miz didn't get me excited. 
Psychology in a match did not get me excited. What the hell is going on? Now, it was a run-of-the-mill match and a feud that just won't die. I will give it credit, though. The pace was decent with a lot of momentum shifts to ensure it wasn't a total bore, with the time going just long enough that I was willing to let it before it really started testing my patience. And Ambrose got a decent reaction for his moves, so when totaling all this up, this match didn't do too bad. Even though I expect more than a one and a quarter star from these two. I really shouldn't have expected anything considering this feud has done nothing to really make me sit up and go, oh wow, these two are pretty damn good. And with that, they're probably going to have a continuation of this feud and this contest come SummerSlam. God help us. Next up, well, we have ourselves a doozy. The ambulance match between Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns, which surprisingly saw the monster among men defeat the big dog in 16 minutes and 35 seconds, dodging a spear to then shut the doors on the man who seemingly retired the Undertaker. But Roman... He didn't take that loss too kindly afterwards, as we know, beating down and putting Braun in the ambulance, driving it away, and then reminiscent of the limo crash that Shane and Kane had in 2003. Or <laughs> the truck ambulance incident that Hogan and Rock did in 2002, he drove it into the back of a semi. Good God almighty, he left the scene with Kurt Angle's eyes bulging out of his head, and Strowman, oh my, <laughs> to quote Michael Cole, he got out of that wreck bloodied on his own two feet. Unreal, ladies and gentlemen. And the thing is, we're going to remember the finish and the post-match insanity more than the contest itself. In all fairness, it did remind me of their payback match, though, in context, with Strowman looking indestructible while still allowing enough room for Roman to showcase himself when applicable. It was fine. The only difference from that match was the crowd enjoyed the systematic but elongated destruction of Reigns constantly, whilst the momentum shift and uncertainty regarding the finish of this match meant that it didn't have the same fervor and atmosphere that I was expecting it to have. Many were just really uncertain that Reigns was going to superhero up and win, and that uncertainty just neutered the crowd and made them feel lackluster at times. Then again, they got into it because Braun, holy mother of God, but they worked in the injury of that elbow really nicely. And I love the fact that he just stood there and took chair shots to the arm and told him to hit me again, you son of a bitch. Oh my God, it was fantastic. And it was a great story through many moments of endurance, desperation, and colossal pain saturation to ensure it was a match that was actually worth my time, even though it ended on a comedic note. The crowd were invested and kept a stable yet slightly disjointed pace going throughout to ensure that it was a match that really was actually pretty decent. Now, I feel it wasn't as good as their payback bout as it came out of left field as a result rather than just a decisive finish. But for all that this match did during it, it gets a solid two and a half stars. Not exemplary, but worthy enough of my time for sure. Now what happened afterwards though? The possible sign of a double turn? And arguably the best on-screen thing we've seen all year, at least for me. I've not marked out for something that insane for some time. God damn, I hope Raw builds on this. If it is a double turn, well done, you've managed to do it in the most badass way possible. I cannot wait to see how this turns out. Bring on SummerSlam, because these two, I have intrigue and interest now. While the fallout from that ambulance match was happening, we got the most weird thing. An impromptu matchup between Heath Slater and Kurt Hawkins that ended in 2 minutes and 10 seconds with Slater slating like he slates. And the ending wasn't even shown on the television. They cut away from the match to focus on the ambulance and the fire truck. What? If the ending of this match isn't even shown on live television, you know it meant nothing and allowed WWE to pull creative liberties with themselves. Hell, I'd have preferred them to have just stuck with the camera shots of the ambulance. I would have loved that because it would have built up more tension and rather than just disrupting it with a random as hell match that really didn't mean anything. The thing is, this match, 
is an unannounced one, but it counts as a match on the card, the results are on the website, the photos are up, it's counted as an official matchup by WWE, it's utter rubbish, obviously, and gets a zero, you would not expect anything else. Now, some people may feel it's a bit harsh actually reviewing this, but hey, if the match happens and both men manages to get an entrance too, I have to count it, unfortunately. The only reason this match won't win the worst pay-per-view match of the year is that Big Show vs. Rusev at Fastlane was a million times worse because it lasted longer and somehow achieved less than a match between these two that actually meant nothing. Shows how much I feel about that match, doesn't it? Good God Almighty. Now, let's uh, get away from this um, utter piece of trash and get onto something interesting, something fun. The Universal Championship main event match, which saw Brock Lesnar defeat Samoa Joe off the F5 in 6 minutes and 25 seconds. Now, I can see why WWE did this match as they did. They wanted to make Joe look as strong, badass, and threatening to Lesnar as possible. Given the build-up, I would not have been surprised if that ended up happening, which it did. And they had Lesnar keep strong by ensuring the F5 retained its impactfulness, while his tenacity and mutant-like endurance made themselves apparent for all to see. Now, while many, including myself, are quite disappointed that not only Joe lost, but also the match lasted so little time, for what they did in that time was very entertaining. And to see Joe take Lesnar out before the bell and for around 80% of the bout kick the absolute shit out of the part-time champion, it was great. And anyone who calls that a squash match has no idea what a squash is as far as I'm concerned. Because there's no way someone would come out of a squash looking as good as Joe did. He got hit by one F5 and a bunch of German suplexes. He manhandled Brock Lesnar for most of a contest. There is no way you can call that a squash unless you think, oh, he loses to a champion. It's a one-off deal. Therefore, he gets buried. Oh, for God's sake. Shove your wrestling inside a terminology up your own ass. That is not a squash and you bloody know it. God. Anyway, the pace was electric, the crowd were loud, but stunned into silence over how ruthless Joe was. Now, while it told the story of his desperation to win by any means, with that low blow especially, I wish it could have gone on longer. That's the main problem here. And see more than one F5 to highlight truly how much of a beast Joe is. But for what we got... I believed that it resembled the Goldberg-Lesnar match from WrestleMania in terms of ferocity, intensity, and quality, which is why I feel appropriate to assign the same rating as that match of two and a quarter stars to this one. Now, if the match went longer, allowing for more crowd investment, more body selling, and a lessening in pace with not as many sudden momentum shifts, this could have easily been the big box office barnstormer and show sealer that many expected it to be. Then again, for the type of match they managed to pull together, this came out very well indeed. Joe looked like an absolute monster and Lesnar retained his imperiousness. And I look forward to seeing whether they do indeed carry this on. Because if this is indeed the last time we see them, it's going to be disappointing because this is money. Lesnar vs. Joe got people interested in Raw for the first time since just after WrestleMania. And I would love to see them continue this. It would be incredible. But the thing is, knowing WWE, they probably will think Joe did great, but they won't do much more. And that's quite disappointing. And ending on that note of this review is surprisingly depressing. But we need to get that out of our minds, and out of my mind especially, as it's time to look back at the final thoughts on Great Balls of Fire. Going into this pay-per-view event where the name on its own could metaphorically, figuratively, and literally suck its own balls, and the build-up outside of the two main event matches and potentially Enzo and Cass 2 left a lot to be desired, I was fully expecting this event to be like the Greasers from Rebel Without a Cause in that driving chicken contest, where they went off the cliff and crashed and burned with no chance of returning. That was what I was expecting going in. However, once again, Raw, out of very very little has delivered a quite solid night of wrestling. 
It's crazy when you think about it, and I can thank the qualities of the stellar talent pool and some shrewd booking decisions for that happening. There was no standout match on the card, with most of them scoring around two and a half or one and a half star areas, allowing for this event though, in a good way, to have enough balance on the card so the poorer matches aren't actually as damaging or as jarring, but to have two of those poor matches happen consecutively in the middle of the card really dampened on proceedings, but to have the opening and ending sections of this event deliver some solid and stellar contests that did get the excitement rolling in and outside of the ring, it's hard to really criticize this event too much. Some of the matches went a little short and the lack of the main event being that barnstorming epic, we didn't get that, it was very disheartening, but this event still managed to keep all its feuds, bar one obviously, in good stead for SummerSlam, which is exactly what a B-show like this needed to do. Now if not for the hastily put together Zero contest and the ambulance match not achieving the heights it could have reached alongside its main event counterpart, this could have been a very, very good show, but instead it lingers around in mediocrity, saved by good consistency throughout. Out. Now, while the matches were fine, meaning the averagest rating it's getting, in terms of excitement, this event did manage to deliver on that throughout the evening. So, all in all, if the match quality was able to replicate the excitement, we'd have been looking at a better show. Alas, this is what happens when you play with fire. It can warm you, but sometimes burn as well. Ladies and gentlemen, goodness gracious, Great Balls of Fire 2017 gets a decent score of 5.25 out of 10. It's a solid night of wrestling with enough to keep you entertained as it's retained stability from beginning to end. And with what it has left for us to pick over, I'm looking forward to Raw tonight and it's definitely one that is not worth missing. So yeah, for the first time in ages, I'm actually going to watch Raw live tonight. Let's hope that pans out well and I don't end up regretting it. Raw, your creative writing team and everyone on the roster, it's up to you to ensure that what this event built can continue momentum. Because if SummerSlam needs us to feel excited, you need to do that. God, bring on SummerSlam. But first, of course, we have a SmackDown pay-per-view to get to. I'm hoping they can match this quality because I didn't expect Great Balls of Fire to go anywhere near the 5 out of 10 bracket. I tell you now, I am still pleasantly surprised we got this out of it. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The Great Balls of Fire 2017 review is done, and I still don't like that name at all. And Vince, if this stays around next year, you better give me a damn good reason as to why. Because the reasons I've heard of why you chose this, it's all just a joke to you, isn't it? I mean... You've got a really puerile sense of humour for a 70-year-old, seriously. I'm 25, and I still believe I have a better sense of humour than you do. And that's saying something, because it shows your tastes are pretty bad indeed. Speaking of tastes, what did you all think of this show? I know it's a divisive one that some say is great, some say is bad, and some, like me, think it's alright. I'm not going to get shot for thinking that, am I? Oh yeah, it's the internet. Of course I bloody will. Anyway, what do you all think? Put your comments down in the comment section where I can respond and gauge the consensus among all of you. And of course, if you don't want to miss out on any of the other wrestling videos coming this month, which includes a Friday flashback review of SummerSlam 2003 coming up this Friday... Good God Almighty. And then after that, we have Battlegrounds review, of course. And for you video game lovers out there, I've got a top five Overwatch Heroes countdown for you. That is going to be awesome. I can't wait to put that out. If you don't want to miss all of that, click the subscribe button down there. And I very much appreciate it. We broke 600 subscribers not long ago. Let's keep that momentum going. And of course, if you want to keep up on what's happening in regards to the monthly schedules and any other video related gubbins that comes through, follow the channel at CC network yt which is the only place i'll be updating things on a regular basis all's well and good right now battleground i already mentioned you need to improve on money in the bank quite a bit because great balls of fire managed to exceed all of my expectations let's just hope that battleground can stick its flag in and say raw we can match you and deliver a good decent show because it would mean that the road to SummerSlam will look a lot smoother and not as bumpy as it seems to be most years. 
I have been Freddie Thomas. You've been people listening. This has been the Great Balls of Fire WWE pay-per-view review for the CC Network. And I will see you all next time.